Chief. Uh, I uh, I've been working as a kernel developer for many years in, uh, on Linux kernel uh, for last few uh, years. I've worked in uh, many different areas of the kernel, and lately I've been working in the memory management area. So today I'm going to talk about how kernel manages free pages uh, and, and allocates to a processes and reclaims from the uh, various processes. So free pages are going to be available to other processes that need them. So um, as I go through this uh, presentation, I'm going to introduce a number of concepts. If there are questions, please feel free to ask them. I'll be happy to clarify those. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the problem that uh, we have been encountering from time to time, especially with our customers, uh, 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 the Oracle customers. And um, I'll describe what the problem is then uh, we'll talk through how uh, uh, it can be resolved. Um, um, and then I'll show you how uh, does it work uh, based upon the data I have gathered. So with that, let's uh, get into what the uh, problem looks like. So on a Linux system, um, the system has a certain amount of physical memory and the kernel manages this memory uh, in form of uh, pages. And uh, uh, each system has a base page size. Uh, so um, uh, kernel uh, uses a base page size to allocate pages and then it can uh, aggregate them in uh, contiguous pages as well to create higher order pages. So um, order zero pages, the base page size, order one page is a, a group of two. So that's a standard body uh, uh, page management system. So as a kernel is uh, managing all of this uh, memory, um, it will allocate pages to the processes that need them when the process uh, releases the page, it goes back into the free pool. Um, now, if you look at a system uh, and it is running a, a, a number of processes on it, it the uh, user space processes um, may not necessarily use uh, all of the uh, memory that's on the system. So uh, what a kernel does is any memory that is not in use by uh, kernel or the user space process, it tries to make use of it to maximize the process uh, uh, on, of the overall system. So it uses all that extra memory as uh, buffer cache. So we'll talk about that. So let's say uh, we are looking at a system uh, that has got large amount of memory. Uh, we are running a, a workload on it and the workload does not by itself allocate a large amount of memory, but it does tend to do a whole lot of IO. So it's reading uh, uh, from the disk, it's writing to the, the disk continuously. And um, what, uh, based upon what we have seen is you are running a workload like this and then all of a sudden uh, you start seeing a message from the kernel saying it's running out of certain order pages, order three pages, order four pages, or you try to start a new program and it just takes a very long time because in the background, uh, the program is trying to uh, get the memory it needs to start running. So system has lots of memory. So intuitively, uh, we shouldn't be running out of free pages. So let's say you encounter this uh, uh, situation. So the next thing you do is you take a look at, okay, so what's happening with the memory on the system? So uh, first thing to do is, okay, take a look at the free memory. So you run uh, say free dash H, which shows you um, what the memory is on the system currently. And this is uh, the data on this slide is from a, a, a system that might have a system where I ran a workload and gathered all of this data. So this is from a real system. Um, so you run the uh, free command. And even though the system has um, fairly large amount of memory, in my case, 722 gigabytes, what I can see is used memory is only 2.7 gig. Yet my free memory is only three and a half gig. That's fairly small amount of uh, memory. And um, to uh, explore further, I take a look at uh, proc buddy info because that shows me uh, where all the free pages are in terms of uh, uh, how uh, they are being managed by the buddy system. Um, so uh, proc buddy info shows me the number of pages of each order. So when I do that, again, I can see that there are very few high order pages. The lower order pages, there are a few, but I can see that most of the memory seems to be not free. So 
on a system that has 722 gigabytes of memory. I'm using only 2.7 gigabytes, yet I'm seeing only three and a half gigabyte of memory free, which explains why launching a new program is taking a long time because there's no free memory available to run it. So what's going on on the system? What's happening really is that, um, as I said earlier, uh, kernel, any memory that is not in use by the user space or any of the uh, kernel subsystems, it tries to use that memory to improve the performance on the system. So it uses that memory as a, a buffer cache. So what the cache is for is any frequently used data uh, on the system. Uh, it can be cached in memory, especially if it's data that's coming from the hard disk, um, reading from a disk is uh, expensive. So any data you can um, cache in the memory and then give it to the user space the next time it asks for the data, you get a significant performance boost. So that's what kernel does. It's just using up all of the memory uh, to cache uh, not just the disk data, but uh, many of the kernel structures as well that are being accessed frequently. So what that means is a lot of this memory that's being used in a, a buffer cache, um, it can possibly be reclaimed because the data that's in the buffer cache can go to the disk if it came from the disk. If the data was not modified at all, you can simply throw out the uh, copy of the disk data um, in the memory because the original data is still resides on the disk. If the data has been modified, the page is dirty, you can write it back to the disk. So we have a place where we can store the data away and then reclaim that page. Um, so uh, that's what kernel does. As the memory demand increases on the system uh, and the kernel has memory uh, it is using for buffer cache, it will keep releasing those pages, putting them back in a free pool. So now it's available uh, for a process. So <clears throat> if we look at that uh, uh, previous scenario, um, let me go back there. You can see that uh, in the output for free A dash H, um, buffer cache is using 716 gigabytes of memory. So that's where all of the memory is gone we need to be able to uh, uh, reclaim pages from there and then make that memory available for the user space and other uh, processes uh, to use. So how does this work? Uh, what uh, kernel does is it does a scan of the buffer cache to see which page, pages can be reclaimed. And this is scan is done by a kernel thread called KSwapD. It wakes up whenever there is a, a memory pressure, it wakes up based upon number of conditions. When it wakes up, it does a scan to see which uh, pages it can reclaim. And after reclaiming any pages it possibly can, it will then uh, wake up another kernel thread, which is kcompactd. What kcompactd does is uh, it looks at all the free pages and looks for which pages are contiguous to each other. And if, uh, uh, pages are contiguous, it uh, coalesces them uh, into higher order pages. So if there are two physically contiguous pages uh, and each page is a base uh, page, it can coalesce them into an order one page. If four of them are contiguous, it can become order two page and so on. So uh, K-Compacti will try to create the highest order pages and as many of them as possible. So uh, the question is, okay, so what causes KSWAPD to wake up and start reclaiming pages? And uh, what causes KSWAPD to do that is the watermarks. Uh, on the kernel, we have got uh, um, watermarks. Whenever we reach uh, the memory, uh, uh, free memory reaches one of these watermarks, kernel will respond to it. So let's take a look at that. So this uh, uh, picture just shows the number of free pages over a period of time. So if we um, start out, uh, say over here at time zero, the uh, system is running, pages are being allocated by processes, pages are being allocated for IO, uh, and we are just moving along. Number of free pages keeps dropping, and we reach a certain point that is called the high watermark. So uh, kernel maintains three watermarks, high, low, and minimum. So when the uh, 
number of pages uh, reaches uh, the high watermark, we know we are starting to run low. The system continues to consume uh, uh, pages until we finally reach the low watermark. When we reach the low watermark, that's when KSOB wakes up because now we are starting to run rather low on pages. KSOB will start reclaiming pages. And while it is reclaiming pages, user space and possibly other IO uh, um, is continuing to allocate pages. And uh, we may be in a situation where the rate of reclamation of pages is being outpaced by the rate of allocation. So what happens is we continue to, uh, the number of free pages continues to drop. And as the number of free pages continues to drop, we'll finally reach a point where we have hit that minimum watermark. And this is where things start to go uh, uh, from bad to worse. When we hit the min watermark, all allocation is stopped on the kernel. The user space asks for a page, it doesn't malloc, it's going to have to wait. When it uh, tries to allocate a page, what is going to happen is kernel is going to go um, synchronously look for pages it can reclaim. And until it can reclaim enough page to satisfy that allocation request, the user space process goes into a stall. And uh, there are uh, certain allocations that will still be allowed to go through even though we have hit the min watermark and those are the GSP atomic allocations that are typically for kernel critical data structure. So from user space point of view, for the most part, once we hit that minimum watermark, uh, we start seeing uh, allocation stalls. And if uh, the request was for a higher order page, which happens typically when you are doing IO. So if you're doing IO from the desk, uh, the uh, IO subsystem is potentially going to ask for order two, three, four pages. When that happens and we don't have a, any a pages of that order and we cannot satisfy a, that allocation request by breaking up a higher order page, then uh, we go into synchronous compaction. And now we have a compaction stall. The user space process is stalled. Compaction happens in real time. Until we have compacted enough pages to create the right order page, system is going to wait. Finally, we start to get uh, out of the water. We start to get more free pages and more higher order pages. And then uh, potentially the number of free pages starts to rise. Case of D is continuing to do its work in the background. It's uh, continuing to reclaim pages. So now we are starting to catch up and the number of free pages starts to go up. We finally hit the low watermark, and then we hit the high watermark. Once we hit the high watermark for the number of free pages right now, that's when case of B goes back to three. So now system thinks we have enough memory, we can continue operating until we are back to uh, uh, the low watermark. So uh, all this makes sense. So these three uh, uh, watermarks are critical to um, when a page reclamation happens, when allocation and compaction installs happen, and how the system deals with it. Okay, so uh, now these, since these watermarks uh, determine how the kernel is going to operate in terms of reclamation, um, it's important to set the right value for them. Now, how are these values set? We start out in the kernel by computing the minimum watermark. And minimum watermark is really uh, set up so that we don't have a situation where kernel cannot allocate uh, pages for its own critical data structures because then we are really in trouble at that point. So kernel computes a minimum uh, watermark which we, uh, it calls min free k bytes. And you can see it uh, from user space because it shows up under prox with VM. Um, so, Kernel computes a minimum uh, 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 a watermark, and then from there, it will uh, compute the low and high by adding an offset. So, uh, the offsets are computed in the routine uh, setup per zone uh, WMOS. Kernel takes that offset that it has computed, and uh, then it uh, takes, um, adds that offset first to the low watermark to compute the low watermark, and then um, adds that offset again to the low watermark to compute the high watermark. And what that offset is, it's um, the larger of, you take either four times of the minimum watermark or 
you look at the watermark scale factor um, number of pages. Um, and whichever is the larger of the two is the offset. And then we just add that too. So what that means is watermark scale factor is another uh, tunable that is visible from user space is under process VM. Uh, and watermark scale factor is writable. So what that means is user does have some say in uh, where those watermarks will get set by changing the watermark scale factor. You can then affect uh, where the low and high watermarks end up and you can affect uh, where the uh, minimum watermark uh, uh, will end up by simply writing to process via min 3k bytes. Okay, so uh, where is the minimum watermark? So min watermark, kernel computes a value, but then it caps it. If the uh, value it computed is higher than this, it will just uh, uh, cap it at that value. And that uh, value was 64 megabytes for a very long time. Uh, this uh, value was set um, sometime in 2003, 2000, uh, 2004 or five. Uh, this is in a pre-git day. So if you look in the git history, that's how far back you can get. And it was set to 64 meg, which probably was okay at that time. But now we have systems with much, much larger amount of memory than we had back then. So minimum watermark is starting to be fairly low for these systems. So finally, uh, in 2020, there was a patch to raise that cap to 256 meg, which is a whole lot better than before. But it's still a fixed cap, irrespective of the size of the uh, memory on the system. So since we can uh, play with the minimum watermark from the user space, and in turn affect when reclamation starts and how long does the reclamation run because reclamation starts when we hit low watermark and it will run until we hit high watermark again. We can change a, a minimum uh, a free key bytes, which is a min uh, uh, a watermark and change those values. And uh, for the Oracle database workloads, that's what we have had to do. Um, because the uh, uh, systems that we work with, these are typically fairly large systems and uh, they are running, they have lots of memory, they, have, uh, they are running fairly large databases. So <clears throat> we are affected by that very low value of uh, uh, min three AK bytes fairly often. So the recommendation from the tech support was when you configure your system, you change the value of min free k bytes depending uh, based upon the uh, size of memory on the system. And um, what has happened is uh, we um, have come up with a formula for here's what the min free k bytes should be based upon the size of the memory. And that number has been revised over the years because as we get to newer kernels, as we get to newer workloads, our memory requirement is changing, not from just the user space, but even uh, on the kernel side. And we find that, okay, watermark is again very low. So the recommendation is revised and it has happened over a number of years. Now where we are today is the recommendation that I have in the table here. That on a system with 16 gigabytes of memory, we suggest setting uh, min free k bytes to 82 meg. Okay, not a big deal, but it's not at all out of ordinary for uh, uh, some of these database systems to have two terabytes of memory. And when you look at two, uh, a system with two terabytes of memory, our formula yields 10.24 gigabytes in min free k bytes, which is starting to get fairly significant. And um, there's no guarantee that we won't have to revise it yet again because workload change, when the kernel, uh, a new kernel comes up, we find a different behavior and we say, okay, change the watermark again. We cannot keep doing this uh, because it's not a, a solution that just solves the problem forever. We have to recompute it uh, constantly. So we need something better, a better solution that is sustainable. So first problem was, of course, the um, cap on min free k bytes was way too low. But at least that problem is gone now. It's in 2020, now we have 256 meg. So at least we start with somewhat of a more of a rational number. But now we still are looking at workloads and uh, trying to tune uh, uh, the watermarks. Let's say we go uh, to manually tuning watermarks so that uh, 
we can respond to what the workload is doing. So most of these systems, they don't have a very consistent activity over the entire uh, uh, course of the day or even entire course of the week. You will have periods of very high activity where we are allocating lots of pages and then the system calms down again. And now we are not allocating as many pages and things are relatively stable. So when we are in high activity period and uh, uh, workload is allocating lots and lots of pages, we need to be able to uh, scan the buffer cache very aggressively and make free pages available so that when the workload comes in as for a, a, a free memory, we can hand it a, a memory immediately and not have to force it uh, uh, to go into an allocation or compaction install because allocation install or a compaction install, it's jitter on the system. It's unpredictable. These are the things customers do not like. Um, so you have queries uh, that run in a certain number of milliseconds, but then suddenly it enters the stall and now we are talking hundreds of milliseconds to complete a query. And uh, it, uh, it's not predictable. So we can try to mitigate that by trying to make free memory available so that allocation succeeds right away. So we raise watermark, works great. While the system is under pressure, we are reclaiming more aggressively. But when the system quiets down, we don't want to leave the uh, watermarks high because when we raise the watermarks, we make fewer pages available to the buffer cache. And we know buffer cache is a good thing for the system in terms of uh, performance. It's helping us uh, uh, see better performance from the system. So let's try to make as much memory available as possible to the buffer cache. And when the system is calm, we do want to hand over most of the memory to buffer cache again. So what I'm getting to is that the watermarks cannot really be static. The watermarks need to change based upon what's happening on the system, what the demand is from the workload. So we have a problem not only with watermarks are not right, we also know that you can't just set them and forget about it. You have to keep tuning them based upon what's happening on the system. Khalid, I have a question on the previous slide. Um, do you remember which um, kernel release that uh, this change went into? The cap? Uh, the cap was, uh, I'm thinking it was 5.9. I'm not 100% sure, I'll have to double check, but I think okay. it was 5.9. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what we are talking about now is watermarks cannot be static. They need to be adapt uh, not just adaptive, they also need to be proactive. Um, because this one system is in a state where it's having problems finding free pages or it has run out of free pages. If you react at that point, it's already late, which is what kernel does today when it hits uh, the low water mark, that's when KSWAPD goes into reclaiming pages. Uh, uh, and um, it's a, if we don't want to get to a point where we are already under me memory pressure when we start taking action. So we want to be able to change the watermarks or at least get KSWAPD to start reclaiming pages early on, well before we get to the point where we don't have free memory available anymore. So <clears throat> reactive behavior for kernel is not going to work too well, which is why we can we often end up in a situation where we hit the low water mark. Case of is running, you can even see it on your system uh, if you run top that case of will uh, periodically hit 90% or 100% CPU usage as it is scanning the buffer cache. But it's just trying very hard to, create, uh, uh, to reclaim free pages, but system is already under severe pressure and the number of free pages continues to drop down. So. How, uh, how can we uh, avoid this situation? Can we foresee in any way possible that system is approaching a point where it's going to start running out of free pages? So how about we take action now before we get there? So that's the problem I uh, set out to solve. 
and we can solve that problem by modeling the system behavior. Um, what if we could take a look at what the system overall has been doing for the last certain uh, period of time, and then project it forward in time, assuming system will continue to behave the same way, we can project it forward and say, we, are, we have this many free pages now, but based upon how system has been allocating pages, we can see that with the same behavior, this many seconds in future, we are going to run out of free pages. And that's uh, not very difficult to do because mathematical models exist today to do just that. So how about we start looking at the system? We take a look at uh, how many free, free pages exist on the system and periodically just take a look at it, how many free pages. And based upon how many pages are available at any given time, we can start to see a trend. We can see the trend that system is uh, allocating pages at a fairly high rate or a uh, moderate rate or a very low rate, or system is actually um, gaining free pages because the user space is releasing uh, the pages it had been using. So we can see a trend line and that trend line can be projected forward in time to see where the system might be in near future. So if we take this trend line and turn it into a mathematical formula, we can express it as uh, the formula X equals AY plus B, where A is the slope of the line. And then using this formula, uh, we can uh, project the system forward in time at any point in time. So uh, in the formula X equals AY plus B, think of X as this is the current number of free pages. Y is the time component. A is a slope and B is a, a, a constant. So these are the values we need to compute and come up with a formula and then start computing this formula on an ongoing basis. So we know when page exhaustion is coming up in future. Well, not only that, we can also watch how, what, how the system is behaving in terms of page reclamation uh, by looking at how many pages were in buffer cache, how many pages have been freed up, we can see what is the current rate of scanning by KSWB. We can do the same thing for K-Compact. We can see the current rate of compaction by just monitoring the number of pages it is creating of higher order. So once we know what is the allocation pattern, what is the uh, reclamation rate, what is the compaction rate for the system, with all, uh, all of this information, we can project forward in time and say, aha, we know in the next 20 seconds or 500 seconds, the system is going to start running out of order five pages. So we better take action now, or system is going to start running off, out of order seven pages, but it's going to happen three hours in future. Okay, no need to ta take action now. Or we look at uh, the data and it says, system will run out of three pages in the next 200 seconds. And based upon the current rate of reclamation, we are not going to recover. So the, uh, slowly we are uh, going to keep declining on the number of free pages. So we need to take action because based upon allocation uh, rate and a reclamation rate, we see a problem coming up. So if we can project forward and come up with this uh, um, a foresight into what the, where the system will be in future, we can adjust watermark now get case to be running a little earlier, get it to run a little longer. So we uh, start reclaiming pages so that by the time our, um, we would have hit uh, uh, free page exhaust, exhaustion, we have already created enough pages that we avoid that whole situation. So let's take a look at uh, how we can do that. So the, form, uh, the method I'm using for this is the method of least squares, which is fairly straightforward. Mm. All it says is you take uh, uh, all of your data and you simply plot it. Um, so we are plotting number of free pages versus time. So I just look at how many free pages exist on the system now, then few seconds later, few seconds later. And I start just plotting all of those uh, dots on the graph. Once I have these dots on the graph, what method of least square says is find a line that goes somewhere by all of these points while covering minimum number of squares, because that line will then 
very closely predict the trend on the system. So that's what we do. We, once we plotted our points, we simply fit a line through it. And this line gives us the system behavior. We can, uh, and this line can then be represented with a formula x equals a y plus b, which allows us to compute uh, future behavior fairly easily. Okay, so now we have an approach. How uh, we can model the system behavior, how we can project uh, its behavior forward in time. Uh, so let's see how we put this whole system together. So what we need is, uh, we need uh, some data. The data comes from the number of free pages as reported in say Proc VM stat or Proc Buddy info. We, take a, uh, we gather the current number of free pages. And then um, once we have uh, enough data points, we can start fitting a, a trend line. But one thing to keep in mind is system behavior is not a static. System behavior is going to change from time to time. So once we compute a trend line, great, we can project that forward. But soon thereafter, the system behavior is going to change. So we need to recompute this line and say, this is how system has been behaving for the last so many seconds. So what I have done is I have created a sliding window. Um, I gather data, certain uh, uh, number of data points, and this is my sliding window. I fill this up, create a trend line. Then at the next sampling uh, period, I'll move the uh, sliding window over, plug in the new data I got, create a new uh, uh, trend line, and simply keep doing that. So this way, the trend line is tracking the system behavior, and it's closer to uh, what the system is doing at the moment. So once I have my trend line, then I can start computing the memory exhaustion points for uh, not just each zone, but the overall system as well. Okay, so now we know how to model the system behavior, how to compute when a page exhaustion is going to uh, happen. So the next step is, what do we do in response to that? So uh, I'm going to take a look at what is the, critical condition I'm looking at that might happen in future. If it is simply free page exhaustion, I'm going to try to force an earlier reclamation and a longer reclamation by uh, adjusting watermark. But what if I'm not running out of free pages, rather I'm running out of higher order pages. So I've got lots of base pages that are free, but I don't have uh, um, enough higher order pages. To deal with that, what I have to do is force compaction on the system. And then since I'm uh, creating this continuously uh, updated model of the system, uh, there's a possibility that I'll encounter a, a period of time where the system is uh, in high activity mode, uh, allocating and changing lots, uh, 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 lots of pages, but then it can enter a slower period. So, I need to be able to see that as well. When the uh, number of free pages starts to go up, I need to be able to back off on the watermark so that now uh, pages can be freed up to be used uh, by buffer cache. Khalid, we have a question on the your uh, linear function in the chat sure. box. Um, would you like to address that now? Of course. Okay, so the question is, is the linear function always a good approximation? Uh, I would expect that in interesting scenarios, it could be anything much more complex and often unpredictable. Linear is probably good only in situations where the load is changing it smoothly enough and nothing really critical is happening. And that is true. There are many ways to uh, model the uh, system behavior. And um, <clears throat> linear equation is a simpler one. Obviously, you can fit a, um, there are many, many uh, mathematical models that exist that will allow you to fit a more complex curve uh, to model the system behavior. My approach is to start with a simpler system and uh, go to complexity only if it is needed. If I keep my uh, sliding window small enough, so I'm responding to more of the instantaneous behavior of the system, a linear model uh, is fairly good at predicting the system behavior. If you make your sliding window very large, then at that point, you will see that if you fit a linear uh, line to all these points, 
you'll see many more squares being occupied in the space between the line and the dots on the graph. So at that point, the linear model starts to get more and more inaccurate. So what I've done is I'm working with a, uh, a smaller sliding window. And of course, um, if actual real life data shows me that a different model, a different mathematical model can give me better results, I definitely uh, would be open to implementing something like that. For now, starting with a, a linear model work, uh, made sense. It's easier to implement, keeps the uh, algorithm simple, and it works as I'll show later from the data. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's keep going then. Okay, so when uh, I started looking at this, uh, the initial um, idea was to implement this algorithm in the kernel. So it will become part of kswapd. Uh, kswapd, uh, every time it wakes up, it could run this uh, modeling algorithm. And if it uh, sees that, okay, we are potentially going to run out of free pages, kswapd could run a little longer. And just make one more pass through the buffer cache and try to reclaim uh, uh, more pages. Uh, kernel has reclaim boost. I could use that to get it to reclaim more pages. And then uh, from case of D, I could also kick a K compact D if we have reclaimed enough pages, or it looks like that we are going to run out of higher order pages, case of D could wake up K compact D and try to uh, create as many higher order pages as possible. So with that idea, we launched this project as an LF Linux kernel mentorship project in summer of 2019. And I created a, a patch working with uh, mentees that were assigned to that project and we implemented the whole algorithm, tested it on a kernel and sent the patch out to LKML for feedback. So there was a good discussion about it. Uh, there was, uh, and the feedback, one of the important ones that came back besides the uh, uh, comments on the algorithm and results was that this really is a policy we are implementing wouldn't it be implemented better outside the kernel in an external daemon? Which kind of makes sense because uh, if you think about it, um, changing anything in the kernel is, uh, takes more work. It requires a customer to update the kernel to pick up new functionality. Whereas if you implement it outside the kernel, you can just update a user space package. So it can work very well from that point of view. But it of course has its downside. Um, if this uh, external daemon is uh, affecting the behavior of the kernel in a critical area like memory management, um, you are not going to get the best behavior out of the kernel unless you install this external daemon as well. So there are pros and cons to both approaches. Um, for now, based upon the feedback, we decided, okay, we'll go ahead and implement it outside the kernel and keep refining it, see what kind of performance we get. And maybe at some point it will make sense to pull it back into the kernel. So that's where we did. And- Khaled, um, yes. do have a question um, before you switch into uh, the demon part. There is a question in the question and answer box that might be better answered now, I think. Sure, let me take a look at it. Okay, so the question is, can you quickly explain what higher order pages as opposed to normal order pages are from a sysadmin perspective? Um, okay, so uh, the way kernel manages uh, uh, memory on the system, it uh, breaks uh, all the memory down into a manageable size called a page. Each architecture has a base page size. So for uh, instance, on uh, Intel architecture is 4K pages. Um, so system, a kernel will take the entire system memory, break it down into 4K pages and keep track of each page. Um, but when we are looking at some of the operations in the kernel, for instance, say you want to do IO where you are going to DMA a whole chunk of data from a disk uh, into the memory, or you are um, uh, moving a whole chunk of data, say off of InfiniBand using RDS into memory. So you are going to need potentially more than 4K uh, 
of free space. And all of that space has to be contiguous. Uh, and also user space uh, will often ask for memory. And if we want to keep it contiguous because then we can minimize the number of uh, the page table entries that we have to maintain because these are uh, this is physically contiguous pages. So what a buddy system implemented in the kernel does is it manages pages in uh, uh, in terms of order. So order zero page is the single base page. And then the order one page is two uh, base pages that are physically contiguous. So um, the order is really order that you would apply to base two. Then order two becomes, uh, four contiguous physical pages and so on. So we go all the way up to order 10. And um, the idea is to keep uh, contiguous memory managed as contiguous memory so that when someone asks for a large amount of memory that's bigger than 4K pages, we know exactly where to go and grab a, a set of pages from there. So hopefully that makes sense. What's the difference between base order, which is order zero page and higher order pages? And of course, what that means is um, if we have a um, whole bunch of say order four pages, but we have zero order three pages and someone wants an order three page, we can just take an order four page and break it down into order three pages. So that's why a, a kernel will try to maximize, uh, uh, it will try to compact pages into the highest possible order because those are, uh, versatile pages, they can be broken down into a smaller order. Whereas if you have order three pages, but no order four pages, and someone asks for order four pages, you can't uh, uh, allocate a, um, multiple order three pages to get an order four page because those pages will not be contiguous. Okay, so when we uh, move from implementing uh, this algorithm in the kernel, to uh, implementing it in user space, we created this mem optimizer daemon. In the mem optimizer daemon, we implemented this mathematical uh, algorithm to compute the trend line, and we are using a window size of eight. It's a small enough uh, window that the data is manageable, yet it uh, has been shown to be pretty good at predicting the instantaneous system behavior. So we created this project and we launched it as an open source uh, GitHub project out there on GitHub, feel free to download, feel free to uh, make code changes. I welcome any uh, changes, any contributions. And so uh, with GitHub, find it over there. And uh, since this is a, a daemon, uh, we added some configurability to it and it just uses standard uh, locations for a, a config file. You can take a look at the config file and you can tweak uh, the behavior of uh, uh, the daemon by changing values in the config file. Uh, one of the other things we have done is uh, the daemon itself uses syslog facility uh, uh, to log what it is doing. And there, there are multiple levels of logging. Uh, so you can set the uh, logging level based upon what you want to see. Since it uses syslog uh, logging facility, you can control where it gets logged and all of that. So if you are running this on your system and you really want to see everything it is doing, go up to the max level, uh, verbosity level of five. And at that point, um, uh, you can uh, see all the computations it's making. Uh, it will compute reclamation rate, compaction rate. It will, uh, it will whenever it makes a, a determination that we are about to run out of free pages of a certain order, it will actually uh, print out what is the logic it used. Here's what it saw based upon that. It thinks we are going to do, we are going to run out of this. Then it will also talk about uh, um, what is the action it's taking. Okay. So uh, the two things we need to implement something like this is, where are we going to get our data from? This is the data we are plotting and creating a trend line from. And then what are the control knobs we can tweak in response to what we are seeing on the system? So in the uh, data sources we are using, uh, there are three we are using right now. And uh, that is ProcVM stat. ProcVM stat gives us uh, information on um, how the page reclamation is working, how many, uh, uh, how the cache pages are being used currently. ProcBuddy info gives us information on how many uh, pages of various orders are currently free on the system. And then uh, ProcZone info uh, gives us a per zone watermark because we need to know what the current watermark is before we try to tweak it. 
So once we have our information and we can start plotting a trend line, then uh, comes in the control now. So in response to memory pressure, mem optimizer uses two knobs to change system behavior. One is the PROX, this VM watermark scale factor. And this is the watermark scale factor I had mentioned before. Uh, watermark scale factor affects the size of the gap between min watermark and low watermark, and then low watermark and high watermark. So by changing the watermark scale factor, we can raise the low watermark and high watermark both at the same time. And then uh, there's a, another uh, file in SysFS, uh, which is uh, Sys Devices System Node, and it's a per node file. So if you have a, a NUMA system, uh, you will have uh, multiple nodes and compact. Writing a one to this file forces the compaction on that NUMA node immediately. Khaled, oh. there is another question. Sorry, is this a good time for? Oh, of question? course. It's in a question and answer box. Sure. Suppose that we have a use case. Uh, we need to have dirty background ratio, very high to avoid a um, uh, IO to death. Can the MUN optimizer work for this workload preventing OOM? Um, okay, good question. Uh, so dirty, uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, the other things we are thinking of doing uh, uh, with MEM optimizer and actually tuning dirty background ratio is on that list of uh, things to look at. So that's something I'm already looking at. And uh, I'll talk about some of the other uh, things we are doing with MEM optimizer because it turns out we can do a lot with this. So good question. And yes, definitely something uh, we are looking at. Okay, so uh, what MEM optimizer does, it starts out, takes a look at cog body info. It gets the number of free pages of each order for each node. And it takes that data, puts it in that uh, sliding window and computes a trend line. So of course, when it starts up, it has to wait until it fills up its sliding window. So it takes eight periods before we have a trend line. Once it has a trend line, that will, it will keep uh, computing the trend line uh, periodically. Uh, so it computes a trend line for each order page and it does that for each zone as well. So we know what's happening on the system, not just overall, but also what's happening at each zone level. And then we also know what the watermark is on each one of the zones. So it creates a, a, a trend line. And then uh, by uh, using the data uh, from PROC VM state, it starts where VM, uh, PROC VM start reports how many pages were reclaimed. And uh, since we are sampling the system at a, a periodically, we can compute what uh, the current rate of reclamation by looking at what we saw last, what we see now, uh, here's the rate of reclamation based upon that data. Same thing with the uh, compaction rate. We look at top body info and we see how the higher number, uh, higher order number of pages is ch changing in the time that we have been sampling the system. And then when it is time uh, for MEM optimizer to port the reclamation, it will scale up the watermark by using watermark scale factor or force a compaction by writing to that compact file. So now we have our model, we have the actions uh, uh, it's going to take uh, in response to what the model tells us. Now the question is how do we know all of this is working? So uh, I needed to come up with a workload that will allow me to see this in action. So the workload, after looking at uh, some of the customer workload and uh, distilling down the behavior that's resulting in these allocation and compaction stalls, what I found was that a workload that does a lot of IO. And in the mix, there's also IO that creates lots of files and then deletes them as well. When I put this workload that is doing a lot of uh, IO plus creating lots of files and deleting them, I start to see that system is running into allocation or compaction stalls. So the workload I defined uh, was, I have a set of SSDs on my test system. So I do nine parallel DDs to the uh, SSDs. And at the same time, I uh, do a kernel compile with make-j60. This is a 96 processor system. It has got 768 uh, gigabytes of memory. So with this, 
I can now monitor the system to see how many stalls uh, I'm seeing. Um, so the goal behind MEM optimizer is to monitor the system and reduce the number of stalls by making free pages uh, available um, in advance of uh, the system requiring them. So the test load is parallel DDs combined with a make dash J60 of the kernel over and over again. And then the metric is the number of installs we are seeing. If I see a change in the number of installs, then I run this workload with MEM optimizer and without MEM optimizer, then I know I'm seeing some good results possibly. Do we have another question here? No, never mind. That's the same question. Okay, so what uh, uh, did the data show us? So I uh, ran this workload, I ran it for roughly 140 uh, uh, minute uh, period because I found the system became kind of stable over that period of time. And I ran this test uh, with uh, four kernels. Uh, so at uh, Oracle, we have the uh, Oracle uh, kernel, which is the unbreakable enterprise kernel. And there are multiple releases that are currently uh, um, uh, being maintained and supported. So I started with the UEK4 and uh, then five and six, and then the current uh, upstream 5.14 kernel. Now, uh, without mem optimizer running, just a raw kernel as it is, I ran this workload and simply looked at what were the number of installs reported by Proc VM stat at the end of the run. And as you can see, the numbers here are uh, fairly high. Um, for the 4.1 kernel, 5,529. And the number stays high even with 4.14, but the number does drop significantly with 5.4 and then 5.14 kernel because we had a number of changes that went into reclamation algorithm in between 5.0 and 5.2 kernel. Those changes did make significant uh, difference to how effective reclamation in the kernel is. And you're seeing the effect of that. So once I had the data on what the system behaves like without MEM optimizer doing its thing, I then added MEM optimizer to the system and ran exact same test again and looked at the number of allocation installs and the number of, sorry, not just allocation, but allocation and compaction installs. And the number of installs went down significantly with MEM optimizer running. So as you can see on 4.1.12 kernel, we went from 5,500 to uh, 625 or so. And then on 4.14, same thing, significant uh, reduction from 3,200 to about 42. Uh, even on 5.4 kernel, there was a still significant reduction. We went from 212 to one. And on 5.14, it goes from 190 to zero. One and zero in my mind are about the same because this is within the noise, uh, margin of noise. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. Khaled, I do have a question. How do you define this stall? What, how long does it last? Is, do you average it out in terms of uh, how, what's the responsiveness? Do you take responsiveness into account? So I'm not computing, uh, I'm not looking at uh, the size of each stall. Um, I'm only looking at the number of installs that happen. So MM subsystem, uh, anytime a, a process enters compaction or allocation installs, it uh, implements a counter. And that counter is reported by proc VM stack. So this is just the number of times we ran into install. Now, that's an interesting data uh, to see how long each install was. And that requires more instrumentation, um, which I haven't done because I'm afraid by instrumenting to uh, uh, compute the size of each install, I might change the behavior of the system. So for now, I'm focusing primarily on how often the, uh, we are seeing the installs. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we have seen uh, uh, what the MEM optimizers can do in terms of uh, improving system performance. Uh, we have been improving the algorithm, adding uh, more functionality. The thing that came out of this was that MEM optimizer is sitting outside the kernel and it is actually looking at the system behavior and modeling it, which means it can potentially do more things besides just changing watermarks. So to start out with, I have added more uh, capabilities to it. We have got a large number of system tunables. 
any sysadmin uh, knows that there's just extremely large number of tunables on the system at this time. And it can be hard to figure out how, uh, how to set up some of those tunables, uh, especially when uh, some of those tunables can change uh, from system to system based upon the configuration of the system. So um, most sysadmins have gotten into the habit of defining the syscutter.con file to change all, uh, all of these tunables whenever the system starts up. So they make a one-time change by using syscutter.con. Well, mem optimizer can do the same thing too, because when it starts up, it starts looking at the system configuration and very quickly it starts to build a system behavior model. So why not have it look at all of this data and based upon that, start coming up with the intelligent defaults for lots of these tunables. So I have uh, um, modulized uh, the code. So mem optimizer cannot do that, that when it starts up, it can compute and set that tunable. But not just that, it, since it is looking at the system continuously, it, it can also see changes happening on the system. So for instance, to start out with, um, I added a trigger that keep uh, an eye on how many huge pages are uh, allocated on the system. And anytime the number of huge pages changes, we know um, we, there might be tunables that need changing. So how about we use that as a trigger? And then I can add uh, actions to these triggers so that whenever number of huge pages changes, mem optimizer goes out and changes this. So there are more things it can do. So you know, we, are, we have been uh, looking at all of this. Um, and we are also looking at how can we improve the algorithm? Uh, today, if I uh, look at uh, the actions that MEM optimizer is taking, if, when it needs to create a higher order pages, it has to kick comb action. That can be a little hard on the system because it's uh, writing one to that uh, um, uh, compact file, it causes the system to go out and do a compaction right away. And uh, <clears throat> If we could reduce that load on the system, that would be a good thing. So one of the uh, uh, features that was added to the kernel recently uh, adds this file process VM compaction proactiveness. Uh, it can tweak how pro uh, proactively the kernel will look for higher order pages. It's somewhat limited because it looks for a specific order pages, but there's something there that I can potentially use and make the um, impact of compaction is a little less heavy handed than it is right now. And also there are many more knobs just under Proxys VM that we could possibly be looking at. So uh, I have listed just a few here, watermark boost factor, sloppiness, uh, min free kbytes, um, uh, dirty background ratio is uh, uh, another one. And then VFS cache pressure, that's another one I'm looking at to see what should govern the value of these tunables? What system behavior should drive this, uh, the values? And what is the uh, connection between how, do, uh, by looking at the system behavior, how should that govern the value of this tunable? Should it go up, should it go down? Should it be 10% of this other value? Should it be five times of this other value? So those are the things um, I'm working on and uh, I'm looking for tunables that have the maximum effect on the workloads people are running. Khalid, then, there is another question in the uh, question yeah. or comment in the question and answer box. And then also we have a raised hand. I think it might be Kenneth. It, you probably have, it's, there is another, if you can unmute and uh, ask a question. Probably we don't have a question here, maybe just a comment. Thank okay. you. Okay, so uh, other thing uh, I'm looking at, currently I'm modeling the entire system behavior and uh, somewhere in the back of my mind, I am thinking that mm, maybe looking at C groups uh, might be beneficial. So that's just a thought. I'm not sure exactly what I want to do with that, but that's on my mind. And also there are other sources of data 
that might be useful. So Daemon is uh, one subsystem that went into the kernel uh, recently, and it gathers data. PSI is another one that gathers special information. So maybe I could use that information to determine how the system is doing, how the system is behaving. So these are just possible future ideas. I'm open to other ideas as well. If you have ideas, you want to contribute code, go to GitHub, clone the uh, repo, feel free to send me a patch. Okay, so uh, any other questions at this time? Uh, uh, what I'm going to do next is uh, show a live system that's the running mem, uh, uh, mem optimizer, that's my test system. And give an idea of how the system behaves under uh, this workload. So all of uh, the discussion we have had so far, it would make it a little more sense when you can see actual data. Okay, so let's move on to looking at the system. Okay, so can uh, everyone uh, see this window and uh, read the text? Do I need to make it bigger? Yes. Yeah, it is it small at the moment. Ah, okay. Okay, so now. Better now? Let me iconify these so they are not in the way. Can you try Control Shift plus plus? That should just make it bigger as well. Okay. It looks like it doesn't work with this extra. Uh, okay. if it, uh, I can make it even bigger if that's yeah. more readable. Okay, so let's do that. Better? Okay, yes. So uh, this system is currently uh, running a workload. And um, let's see. The workload on this is uh, just what I had described. So um, I've got a, a bunch of DDs running on it. The system is going to be a little slow because it's under tremendous memory pressure. I'm not running mem optimizer on it right now because I wanted to show what's happening on the system. So I've got uh, all these DDs running. They are writing to an SSD. I've got three SSDs and uh, there are three DDs happening to each SSD. And then uh, there's um, also kernel compile happening in the background. So on this system, if we look at what is the state of free memory, we have got uh, 722 gig total and currently 75 gig is free. 643 gig uh, is in use on uh, uh, for buffer cache. And here's the data I'm using to see what kind of stalls I'm seeing. So when I started this workload on the system, I started right after rebooting the system. So the number of total stalls was zero. At this point, we have got uh, 1287 plus 425 plus 423, this many installs on the system. And uh, you can see this behavior in top. Um, most of the memory is tied up in buffer cache and we just had 75 gig of free memory, it's already down to 53 gig. So this memory continues to dwindle until we hit the low water mark. And then at that point, um, reclamation happens, memory starts to go up again. Um, we, uh, we would have hit a allocation and compaction install in, in the meantime. Um, so uh, these are uh, the data sources I'm looking at. Uh, proc VM set as well as proc buddy info, uh, which shows me uh, the various order pages. Right now the system is not too bad a shape. We are out of pages up here, but on node one at least, 
down here we have some pages available on node zero we have some pages available here but this number again as uh, uh, we keep doing io and allocating pages uh, this number will uh, continue to go down and just in the time uh, we were talking free memory is down to 39 gig and uh, the number of stalls we haven't hit a stall yet, 287, 425, 423. But as this number continues to go down, we are going to start hitting uh, stalls very soon. So on this system, we are running with the default uh, watermark scale factor, which is set to 10. And that in turn, affects the watermarks that we have. So if you uh, go into proc zone info, um, after the per node is set, then uh, we start seeing information on what the watermarks are. So this is the uh, DMA zone. So let's get to uh, normal zone. Okay, so if we look at the normal zone, here's our min watermark for this zone. Here's the low watermark and here's the high watermark. Uh, this is the number of pages. This is the value we are going to try to tweak. Um, so uh, when I launch uh, a mem optimizer, so mem optimizer uh, registers itself as a systemd service. So you can start and uh, stop it uh, using systemd. So if we start that, System is slow just because it's under tremendous pressure, uh, which you can see from this low amount of free memory. So, what was that variable you are going to uh, tweak, Colin? Uh, process VM watermark is scale factor. Okay. We can change that. So, this value, uh, it's uh, it goes from uh, ten up to a uh, thousand, and. Uh, uh, so it looks like as the system is under so much pressure, I can't even start this service. Um, uh, typically, I would start this service when the system uh, uh, boots up, um, then everything is calm and quiet. But let's just try it one more time, just in case it starts up. Okay, this time it starts. And uh, it will start logging. So it takes, um, uh, a little uh, a bit of time, um, about uh, two minutes for it to gather um, enough data to start modeling the system. So let me bring up another window. This is the compilation happening in the back, kernel compilation. Okay, so we are uh, down to about three gigabytes of free memory and uh, mem optimizer is now starting to look at how the uh, system memory is dwindling so uh, once it re uh, it has enough uh, data points to uh, compute a trend line that's that's when it starts to um, take action so the first action it should take is once it sees that the uh, number of free pages is uh, continuously going down is to raise the watermark and um, it tries to guess uh, it tries to compute uh, when we are going to run out of uh, free memory by looking at the current reclamation rate and current allocation rate. And then it will raise watermark in proportion to that, how far out that event is when we are going to start running out of uh, memory. So it will raise the watermark a uh, little bit. And if things don't improve, it might raise it further. And then same thing happens on the uh, other side as well. When the system starts to slow down, then, uh, it will drop the watermark by like 10%. Uh, it will drop the watermark scale factor by 10%. So it reduces the watermark if the system continues to stay uh, either in a stable state or the number of free pages continues to go up, then um, uh, it will continue to drop the uh, watermark until we drop all the way down to uh, 10. And this range where uh, mem optimizer will vary the value of watermark scale factor, you can 
uh, tweak it by setting its aggressiveness. It supports like three levels of aggressiveness. In the most aggressive one, it will let the watermark its scale factor go all the way up to 900. That's the highest I, I set it to. Um, less aggressive, it will sample simple, uh, system less periodically. The periodicity is something like 15 seconds when it's most aggressive, uh, which is number three, um, 30 seconds and 60 seconds. And then same uh, thing applies to the highest level, it will set the watermark scale factor to 900, 700, and 500. It, um, looks like we have a question in the Q&A. Um, have MEM optimizer been used in production yet, or do you have any known of any production use today? So we are just starting to deploy it on customer system. So it's not on a customer system yet. We have been testing it uh, internally. We have got um, test systems that uh, run workloads very similar to what some of our major customers are running. So we model the same uh, kind of behavior. And on those systems, we have seen um, improvements in the number of installs we have been seeing. So as you can see, now that uh, Mem Optimizer has built its memory model, uh, it's, st it's starting to take action. So it was running out of our order three pages here. So on no, a node zero, so it uh, did a compaction there. And here is what its logic was, how many pages are currently available, what is the consumption rate, and so on. So uh, based upon all of that, it triggers compaction on node zero. So that's uh, just that simple. It will uh, keep doing this. Every time it updates its system model, like it just did right now, uh, it will compute uh, which node is running out of three pages, high order, or base pages, and then either do reclamation or compaction. Okay, so that makes sense. Okay. Then I have got uh, uh, some data uh, that I gathered from my test system that can also show how MEM optimizer is affecting the behavior um, of the system and how it is getting the results. So it's, um, uh, it's a little easier to see the impact it's having by looking at the actual data. Let me close these out. There is one more question in the question and answer box. Yeah. Do you have a rough estimate on how big the impact on system resources of MEM optimizer is in terms of CPU maybe? Um, so MEM optimizer daemon itself is very lightweight. Um, the impact is uh, in the noise region. Where the true impact comes in is when it forces a compaction. At that point, the kernel is scanning buffer cache. Uh, it's scanning the uh, free pages to see which ones can be compacted. And that, that can be, depending upon the state of the system, it can consume resources because to compact pages, what kernel has to do is it may have to migrate pages. So it may uh, take pages from one end of the uh, free pool and move it elsewhere so that uh, the page could be made contiguous with another free page and thus be compacted. So compaction can be a little more heavy handed process. And that depends um, pretty much on what the state of the system is. But even on my test system where you can see it's uh, so busy that the response time is uh, slow. Um, even on that system, I don't see significant CPU resource usage by K-Compact D or k -swap -D. Once in a while, I'll see k -swap -D pop up um, consuming about 80% CPU, but it typically doesn't last more than a second or so. And most of the time, k -swap -D is not even in the top 50 processes uh, because they keep running talk to monitor who is consuming uh, all the resource. So, so far, observation has been that it's fairly lightweight. Okay, so let me start with the um, okay this chart. So uh, I have written a script. Sorry, let me close this. Distracting. Um, I have written a script that just runs continuously on the system and uh, gathers data. It captures proc beams, proc body info, a whole bunch of uh, proc and this files, and then I can take all of that data. And I have a, a script that uh, sorts through that data and create graphs that allow me to see visually uh, what's happening on the system. So this is just 
um, uh, the information from uh, Proc Buddy Info uh, plotted uh, uh, over a period of time. So these are just number of free pages currently available of each order. Each order has a different color. And uh, this is how uh, things are proceeding on the system. So now, this is when the workload I described was running on the system. So workload is just moving along. And as you can see, the, the number of free pages is very low. And then at some point, we hit the low watermark and KSOPD kicks in. When KSOPD kicks in, it goes into reclamation, it wakes up K-Compacty, which does compaction, and all of a sudden, we get a whole bunch of free pages. These are all the pages that were reclaimed from buffer cache. So now we have a good number of orders, zero, one, uh, and so on pages. But the workload is still running, so it starts consuming those pages, and we are back down to very low number of free pages until we hit the watermark again, and then um, once we hit the low watermark, case swap the runs again. So you can see how uh, the system is behaving in response to the number of free pages going down. Now, how does this behavior change when we run MEM optimizer? So I have another chart from the data I gathered running same workload, um, but with uh, MEM optimizer running. Okay, so let me separate it out and put them side by side. So this is what happens when we are running MEM optimizer in the background. As you can see, MEM optimizer in the background is constantly trying to keep the system ahead of the workload. So we do hit low number of uh, free pages, but it's not as severe as we had over here. And um, the system, the number of uh, free pages available on the system is a little smoother. Now, of course, the number of free pages is gonna uh, keep dropping, but what MEM optimizer is doing is it's looking at the system behavior and anticipating how many, uh, what the number of pages required might be. So it just tries, it, instead of trying to create the highest possible number of free pages, it's trying to create enough free pages so that the system will not run into its stalls. And um, you can see the, how, uh, MEM optimizer does uh, this. So for instance, if we look at this uh, data here, so it was right around time uh, stamp number 21, where um, the number of free pages went up suddenly. So let me bring up another piece of information here. Uh, I also captured the log that I was showing earlier from MEM optimizer. So we can see what MEM optimizer did that resulted in a change in behavior on the system. So over here, um, so let's go back here first and take a look at, oh, let's say this timestamp. Uh, at this timestamp, a MEM optimizer uh, decided that uh, reclamation is recommended because we have high memory consumption rate. So that is a timestamp 1314. We can go down here and find the timestamp when my other script captured the data. So 1313 is where it captured data, then again at 1315. So this between these two lines, this one and this one is where uh, MEM optimizer took action. And the action it took was, it decided reclamation is recommended and um, it dis, uh, based upon the current consumption and the reclamation rate, it uh, figured that the time to go below high water mark is 190 milliseconds. And based upon the current rate, the time to catch up is going to be 216 milliseconds. So we better start working now. So it raised the water mark factor all the way from 10 to 490. And here's the effect we see of that action. Right here, we have some free pages, but we are starting to run fairly low uh, on some of these pages. Watermark uh, scale factor was changed and that kicked uh, K swap D, kicked K compact D, and all of a sudden you can see the effect of that. The number of free pages went up and we created more higher order pages. And then uh, as we uh, go along, you can see those pages will get consumed again. And then somewhere around say timestamp 30, MEM optimizer did something again, and you can correlate it with the um, action logged by uh, MEM optimizer again. So 1355 is right about here, where we raised watermark, 
and then we, uh, we raise watermark again here. So uh, this just shows that um, the actions the um, mem optimizer is taking, they do result in uh, changes to the system behavior. And because we increase the number of free pages available, hence we end up with a fewer allocation and compaction installed. And uh, I've got uh, data from uh, some of the other files as well, and they all show similar behavior. So for instance, um, I also captured the um, fragmentation. This chart shows what the fragmentation looks like when mem optimizer is not running. Uh, one is of course, really bad fragmentation. You want these numbers as low as possible. So if you look at the same chart for node zero from the same run, the chart is smooths out quite a bit in terms of fragmentation. There are not as many peaks and uh, Overall, the fragmentation stays lower than what it was without the memo optimizer running. Okay, so everything makes sense? I have one question. Um, have you looked into, there is at least, uh, Git GitGrep shows me, there is one instance of a deadlock situation with uh, min free bytes being, uh, K bytes being too small. Uh, have you ever uh, run into a deadlock because of this in your workloads? And would a mem optimizer help um, avoid deadlocks? So I can't say I have seen a deadlock, but I have seen allocation failure. So um, uh, we have a workload where uh, we were able to uh, reproduce an order three allocation failure very often. Mm. And in that situation, a mem optimizer does help. Uh, it probably will work, uh, help with that deadlock as well, but I'll need a, to create a workload that can reproduce that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'll hand it back to Megan and Shua to wrap this up. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Khalid and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be available on the website. We hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful day.